All right, everybody. Hi, I'm Anne. Uh, I'm with Standout Earth. You are in the right place um, for the Changing the Game webcast about Tesoro Savage today. And welcome to our um, all of our participants uh, by the Zoom system and also by Facebook Live. I'm Anne with Standout Earth, and I am now going to introduce um, our facilitator. Alex Rommel is our Executive um, Oil Field Director with Standout Earth. And throughout his career, Alex has worked to build local communities um, power to build a sustainable future. And we're very happy to have him facilitating today. And Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to you and close down my webcam and let you um, introduce the speakers and the topic and get us going. Great. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for, thanks for doing all the, uh, the logistical work and all of the organizing and managing all of this. And um, thanks everyone for, for joining us today. This is, um, I think, going to be a really exciting discussion. It's, it's partially exciting because we get to talk about this huge victory uh, against big oil. And I think, especially these days, all of us can, can benefit from having our spirits lifted, hearing about our friends and allies and movement successes. Um, but I'm also really excited to, to focus on, on the, I think, a particular feature of this victory, which is the, uh, the amazing coalition building work that was done. So uh, joining us today to talk about uh, Tesoro, the Tesoro Savage victory, um, and maybe raise your hand or, or wink or, or something else to let folks know who you are. Um, today is Paul Lumley, who is the former executive director of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, CRITFIC, and he's now the executive director of the Native American Youth and Family Center, NIA. Paul helped CRITFIC advance its mission of ensuring a unified voice in the overall management of the fisheries resources and as managers to protect reserved treaty rights through the exercise of the inherent sovereign powers of the tribes. Uh, Julie Carter is a policy analyst also with CRITFIC. Julie provides legal support and analysis and policy direction to all departments within the organization as well as to the policy, legal, and technical staff of CRITFIX for tribal members. Uh, Kedra Claybaugh is uh, the president of the uh, Longshore and Warehouse Union Local 4 in Vancouver, Washington. Kedra also serves on the Local 4's Political Action Committee, and he was chair, or excuse me, he was vice president of the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, between 2004 and 2008, and Kidger's a uh, third generation longshoreman. Glicerio Cerita is an organizer with One America. Glicerio uh, has led rallies across Washington State to inform elected officials about the issues that affect the immigrant and refugee community, and he's helped to build power within those communities by getting everyday members involved in politics. And Jasmine Zimmer Stuckey is a senior organizer with the Columbia Riverkeeper. Jasmine works to support community members all along the Columbia River. Her role is to inform and engage residents in Washington and Oregon on coal export and oil terminals that will transform the Columbia River into a dirty energy corridor. She serves as co-director of the Power Pass Coal Coalition and is working with a network of organizations and activists to form a new fracked gas coalition. So as, as a um, observer of the Tesoro Savage fight, I was continuously struck by the breadth and range of organizations working to stop this oil train project. Um, and, the and the organizers and members of that coalition, including these folks today, really do deserve to be applauded. I think almost every campaign I've ever been involved in has at some point uh, had someone say something to the effect of, oh, let's go get blank to join us. Um, and while there's obviously some, some problematic issues with that approach, I really do believe that the instinct that we can be stronger together is the right one. But coalition building is hard work. It's time consuming. It's e easy to stumble, to be inattentive, to make mistakes. So when we see an example like this of it being done well, I think it's valuable to explore what worked and, and also to learn what can be done better next time. So I'm gonna start off with just a very quick review here at the beginning of the webcast um, 
of the project. I don't really want to get too deep into the weeds. This, this really isn't a conversation about policy and law. It's really about how, how we work together. Uh, but just so that we're all sort of on the same page about a few of the, of the basics. Um, folks should know that the Tesoro Savage project was first um, um, proposed five years ago as a joint venture between the Tesoro Oil Company and Savage Logistics. They plan to build a facility that would have bought 360,000 barrels a day to Vancouver, Washington by train. That's plus or minus four or five 100 car long oil trains every single day would easily have been North America's largest um, oil train facility. Those trains would have passed through dozens of communities all along the rail route, where they would then have been loaded onto barges on the Columbia River with the intent to bring fracked shale oil and tar sands to destinations um, all on the Pacific. The proposed property of the project is owned by the Port of Vancouver, which is a public agency that leases the land, uh, that had leased the land to the, the project proponents. And just um, in terms of policy-wise, uh, under Washington state law, this project is so big that it was um, routed through a special process, a multi-agency council called the Energy Facility Siting Evaluation Council, or FSEC which was charged with conducting an environmental impact statement and then making a recommendation for certification to the governor. So the, the, the Pacific Northwest has really not been a stranger to these kinds of massive energy export projects. Um, a few years before this project was proposed, there was a series of coal export terminals uh, that, that was brought forward and a broad range of organizations uh, was formed um, sort of a backbone of opposition throughout the region uh, called the Power Past Coal Coalition. So when these oil train projects, in, including this one, uh, started popping up on Washington's coast and along the Columbia River, many of these same partners formed the Stand Up to Oil Coalition. And that regional coalition and its members worked together with frontline groups and impacted communities to build this large, diverse, and vocal set of local and regional opposition to the project. They turned out crowds at every stage of the public process. They urged the most comprehensive possible environmental review. Um, some members joined as interveners in the legal process. Um, they asked the governor to deny the key permits and they urged the court to cancel the lease. And they won at just about every stage of the fight. The environmental review was extensive. It identified multiple significant and unmitigatable impacts. The Energy Facility Siting Evaluation Council unanimously recommended that the governor deny the project. And last month, he did so. And then simultaneously, there was another strategy, and two members of the Vancouver Port Commission were elected, largely based on their opposition to this project. The second of those won last November. He took office in January, and almost immediately, with a new formed majority, they exercised their authority to begin canceling the oil company's lease. So by next month, the company will no longer have access to the site, which means that functionally, even if the governor's decision were to be appealed, and even if that appeal were to result in it being overturned, the company's lease will already have expired, which to me is, is sort of this beautiful and almost artistic victory. And I really believe that the breadth of the coalition uh, that was opposing this project, um, it was inspiring. And it was foundational to the success of that opposition. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to hear from those, uh, some of those members who are with us today um, so that they can tell us uh, what worked um, and, and support folks uh, across, the, across the country, across the US and Canada uh, with us today who are working to build similar kinds of coalitions. So we're gonna, I think, start off with a little bit of a, um, just sort of a round table discussion. Uh, I'd love to hear from, from each of you. Tell us a little bit about why the uh, Tesoro Savage fight was important to, to your nation, your community, your organization, um, and, and fill us in on the role that, that you play in this fight. Um, and feel free to jump in, otherwise I'll call on you. 
I guess I'll go first then since nobody's jumping up. Thanks, Paul. Well, um, if this uh, proposal were to go through, all of these trains would have traveled through the Columbia River Gorge where uh, four tribes have uh, treaty Indian uh, fishing rights that were reserved with the federal government in 1855. And there are a number of reasons why that's disturbing. The first, uh, an obvious one is, what if there was a major catastrophe, oil spill and explosion uh, that would have impacted not only the fishermen who live and reside on the river, but also could destroy our, our salmon runs. So we're obviously very concerned about that. And we'd already even seen um, one explosion occur um, just a few years ago in a city called Mosier. And uh, while the opponent was trying to argue that um, about the percentage or likelihood that there might be an explosion or a spill, the reality is we already saw one. So the eventuality was, was for certain. We also um, fish and live right on the river and there's not much uh, room between a cliff, a highway and a railroad in the river. And so we have to cross these railroad tracks uh, every day to get to our fishing sites. And uh, if we increase the number of trains um, by 10 or more a day, it's gonna increase the likelihood of, that we would have even more loss of life. We already endure that on a daily basis. So increasing the train traffic would have been uh, very disturbing. And um, so when I was executive director of the Columbia River and Travel Fish Commission, of course, I took my job very seriously, but also as a citizen of the Yakima Nation who fishes in that area, I have a very vested interest in making sure that my family is safe and that our fish runs are sustained well into the future. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe um, I should follow up since right. I worked for Paul. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a policy analyst lawyer here at CRIPFIC, and um, basically I support what our commissioners um, direct me to. And so I'm going to step back a couple, maybe a decade, um, where we got into this fight, and that was Bradwood Landing. There was a LNG proposal, uh, it was an LNG export, eventually import um, proposal for Brywood Landing um, down in Oregon, and it was Chinook Habitat, and that was, was the first time that the um, our member tribes um, said, hey, we are really concerned about this development on the river that's going to affect, directly affect um, our treaty uh, fishing resources, our fish. And so I started exploring that and I brought back the information to our commissioners and they were like, no way, we can't have this. This is not the way to go on the river. And so um, that started a, a CRIFIC starting to, I mean, we started joining forces with some of the environmental groups and particularly with the Columbia Riverkeeper. And that's where that coalition started. Um, we, you know, uh, you know, tribes are a little um, suspicious of environmental groups. Um, they tend to be, you know, white guys, NIMBYs, and not really interested in respecting tribal sovereignty and tribal interests. So it was a little bit at first um, uh, a work in progress, but we learned that there were important issues that we had in common. And um, that jump started us into, hey, we need to work together and look at all this other development that's going on in the, in the Columbia um, Basin and along the river. And that, that segued into the coal um, tr uh, energy transport and then the crude. Um, and eventually Tesoro fell into our laps and as a lawyer, I put on my lawyer hat, um, we joined with Earth Justice and the other groups to oppose that. So it was just sort of a matter of our history um, working to oppose these projects that we eventually ended up in Tesoro. And, you know, I can't say it as good as Paul did that this, these projects will affect and um, the livelihood of the people we work for. Jasmine, can I call on you since uh, Columbia River Keeper was, was yeah. brought up? Great. So I'm uh, Jasmine Zimmer Stuckey with Columbia Riverkeeper, and um, our organization got involved because uh, we uh, are out um, in the communities along the Columbia, working to you know, protect the communities who live alongside the Columbia, but also um, 
the river itself and the water quality um, for, you know, with the goal of, you know, restoring salmon habitat and restoring our salmon runs. The Columbia is a really unique resource. It's a working river in that it supports, you know, ports um, and those jobs associated with them. Um, but it also supports the fishing community, um, commercial fishermen, tribal fishermen, um, and a really robust uh, sport fishing community all come to the Columbia River for the salmon resources. So everyone has uh, a little bit of skin in the game when it comes to protecting the Columbia. Um, we as an organization were one of the uh, founding members of the Stand Up to Oil Coalition, which is uh, the coalition that kind of formed as the backbone to the, um, the fight against the DeSoro Savage Oil Terminal. It wasn't the only fight that the um, coalition put, um, took on. We were actually flooded with oil terminal proposals, um, not only on the Columbia, in multiple spots on the Columbia, up in Grays Harbor, um, and throughout the region. And so we all came together um, with a broad geography of organizations um, with different missions uh, to stop these proposals. So there were groups from um, Eastern Washington, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, um, folks from a health professional background, faith leaders, uh, the labor community, emergency responders, and all coming together to work in solidarity with tribal nations to um, identify you know, the best strategy to defeat these oil terminal proposals. Thanks, Jasmine. Kusari, want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, this five five was important for uh, for nationally because uh, uh, it was one of the largest oil terminal in the in the country. So, but besides that, uh, I knew about this problem because I uh, one American member who is living closer to the railroads. His name is Marcio Carrasco. He I visit him one day at at his home and then. He was talking to me, to me, and explained to me about this issue that he was worried about. He was living closer to the railroad, and then um, I didn't know much about this trouble. But and then uh, I talked to more people, and I find out that uh, there there is a large of immigrant communities living closer to in the Fruit Valley uh, area. So um, I talked with my supervisor, and then uh, as one Americas that we fight for uh, the rights of immigrant peoples in Washington State. So we. Jump, jump into the fight and yeah we did a lot of work uh, uh, we were knocking doors talking with the community to educate them about the issue and then uh, organizing uh, community forums where we invite all these people and then uh, we we try to explain uh, the how this problem it would affect them on the on the future so yeah it, it was a lot of work but also I got a lot of support of uh, uh, members here in my community in Vancouver also from uh, I can mention Dan, Dan Spanky, one of the really good people and then uh, all people around him that really bring me a lot of support on that yeah thanks Kedra you want to jump in yeah yeah so uh, my local was uh, actually in the midst of a lockout from United Grain Corporation time the uh, the proposed oil terminal came up so we were pretty much already in fight mode with the board and with our employers um, as soon as we heard about the proposed oil terminal uh, we brought it up at the membership meeting and uh, some guys got up and voiced their concerns saying hey you know we already see that these guys can't get their product from point A to point B without you know a, some kind of derailment or explosion or spill uh, and now they want to bring this many trains to our port. Um, you know, on a on a monthly basis, we deal with derailments at the port. It's just a, just part of doing business for the most part. And those those are derailments that don't get recorded. Um, so we knew that that the uh, as, as far as rail safety, what BNSF was was telling everybody about these rail cars was was you know not true at all. Um, at, anyway, at the union meeting, uh, somebody made a motion to oppose the, uh, the oil terminal, and it passed unanimously. Uh, a little while later, I'm guessing within a week, we had a court commission meeting, and uh, I, I was president at the time, and it was, it was my job to uh, 
you know, voice the, uh, voice the locals position on the oil terminal. And I got up and told them that we absolutely 100% oppose this oil terminal. Some of the other reasons we, uh, we wanted to oppose the terminal was, uh, you know, we, we have a small strip of land that we work. It's about a mile long, about quarter, quarter to half mile wide. And, uh, you know, beyond that, we, we don't, that, that's our work area. And they wanted to take part of that away. Um, you know, land that, that creates good paying jobs for, for our community. And they were going to clog it up with, with an oil terminal. And uh, so th those were all reasons. Another good reason that, that we were opposing it was, uh, you know, any kind of spill on the river puts us completely out of business. So, you know, safety concerns and uh, knowing that uh, Tesoro is uh, not, not, a, not a company that's responsible. So. Great, thank you. So maybe just, just kind of digging in a little bit deeper. Um, Thinking back to the early stages of the campaign, what were some of the, the most important things that, that from your perspectives um, sort of needed to be changed in terms of bringing in new allies or partners or changes to the, the political landscape in order to be able to, to stop this project? Um, and just sort of thinking about our audience, are, are those relationships or landscapes, ones that you think are, are mirrored in other places facing similar fights? I'll go ahead and speak on that if that's all right. Sure. So, uh, you know, being a, being a union member, I've been, a, been in the union now for, for 23 years. Um, you know, being a union member, you always hear it. You know, anytime there's any kind of problems, it's like, let's blame the environmentalists, right? Oh, the environmentalists want to stop this project. You know, and, and when you get to talking to your members one-on-one -on -one or in a group or whatever, and you say, you know, you know, what exactly is it the environmentalists are doing that's so horrible, right? I mean, you talk to guys in my local and say, hey, you know, you're a hunter, right? You're a fisherman. You, you, want, you want a good, clean place to go and catch fish that you can eat, right? Um, I, I think when you break it down and, and you put all the stigma aside from being environmentalists or union thug or, you know, whatever, however you're classified, and you start talking, you realize you got a lot more in common than, than you have apart, at least these groups. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, in my union, it, you know, it's not, a, it's not a paid position being an officer, like, like myself being president. You know, I work every day. I go down to our grain elevator, and that, that's where I make my living. You know, there's a lot of unions out there that have paid reps. They just hire them off the street with no, they have no uh, famili familiarity with, with the union that they're representing. So, you know, for us, we all know each other. We're able to talk to each other. And, uh, you know, that's a big thing for us. But as far as reaching out to other groups, it's just, it's just making sure that you understand we're not that different. We can all work together and on, on a cause that we believe is important to us. And, you know, it's all, it's all about putting the, I don't know, putting the uh, divisions aside and, and getting to work. Paul, did I see you raising a hand there? Well, um, you know, I was re really struck by the last few comments and totally agree with them. And uh, while I spent most of my life uh, fighting for tribal rights, uh, I don't necessarily consider myself an environmentalist, but I have a lot of environmentalist feelings. And sometimes it's hard for us to also uh, reach across uh, to people that sometimes appear to us to be the other side. And uh, once we find out, like we all have in this campaign and other campaigns, that we're all just people at its core, I think it helps. It helps us to form these coalitions that cross lines like this and make a big difference. Because when the issue becomes one that is really an attack on our community and not one of environmentalists or conservative people or people who just want jobs, when it looks like a whole community is being attacked, we all come together. And I think that's really what, what uh, was so powerful in, in this campaign and this movement was because all sides were willing to, uh, to do what it takes uh, to form those lasting bonds, that trust and that friendship to do the right thing together and protect our communities. <laughs> so just, I just want to on top, go on top of what Paul said. 
what was really effective in the Tesoro case was um, working together with the uh, private interests. Um, there was a development down in Vancouver. Um, they're developing the waterfront. And those are typically people, that, they're developers, and they're typically people that we may not co uh, have a coalition with on some of these issues. But they don't want that because they want to develop the, the community there on the waterfront. And they didn't want those crude um, trains going by their new development. And so that to me was a very powerful connection that, hey, we are in this together. And while our arguments in front of FSEC were significantly different, <laughs> um, at the end of the day, it all works to come together for success. Yeah, from a, from a coalition perspective, uh, I know that from the very beginning, it was clear that we, uh, that there were so many people who had, um, whose you know, livelihoods would be at stake if this project um, were to be built. It wasn't just the uh, environmentalists who would lose, it was so many more people. And so really basic things like choosing the you know, the name that many of us operated under, the, the Stand Up to Oil Coalition, mm -hmm. allowed for, you know, folks who don't come from an inherently environmental background um, or even inherently anti-oil background to say, we are going to stand up together to this one project. Um, that, so that was, it was very clear from the very beginning that um, the broadest, you know, we're fighting the oil industry. We had to be as broad as possible in our opposition. We couldn't silo ourselves as um, environmentalists and fishermen and hunters and union. And, um, we all had to come together. And, uh, and fortunately, there were two really parallel tracks we could put our campaign on. One was, you know, focusing on the Port of Vancouver and supporting the Vancouver community in um, ending the lease that the port um, offered to, to Soros Savage. And then the other was um, focusing on Governor Inslee and the role that he played with the FSEC process. Um, so we had two very clear tracks to direct people on, both locally and throughout the region. So, uh, then, I guess I'd, I'd love to hear more about what you think made the, the coalition lasting and successful. Um, uh, in particular, there was, a, there was, as we discussed a little bit, there was a series of different fights, both coal and oil. Um, and Jasmine, you're now working on the, uh, on the fracked gas coalition as well. Um, so there's a, there's a future in front of us also. Um, would, would love to just kind of hear some of the, uh, some of the lessons learned and the experiences about really what helped move from, you know, one, one issue to the next. Um, and this is a five year long, five year long fight. So what um, helped sustain that coalition energy? I can, I can start um, with a little bit. Um, so for me, the, the goal of um, for fossil fuel companies, they, they really know what they're doing and um, they come in, they target communities with glossy messaging, PR, um, they inundate, you know, people, oftentimes folks fighting these projects, they feel sort of very overwhelmed or flooded with, you know, these pro-oil messages. Um, that's, that's a traditional playbook for the industry. And I think that the goal of the coalition is to support community members who want to fight back, um, to elevate that local leadership, um, while also providing an opportunity for people throughout the region to also join in the opposition. I mean, as Paul mentioned, you know, tribal fishermen hundreds of miles away would be negatively impacted by this project. So how can their voices be included in the local fight or um, you know, fishermen at the estuary? So I think the goal is kind of this 
like, like synergistic of like include elevating local voices and finding ways for the regional community to um, to also explain why this is a, a bigger issue than just um, the Port of Vancouver. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Uh, totally agree with that. And uh, I think one of the challenges we had was the, um, the, the folks on the other side, the people that are making the proposal, were trying really hard to make this only an argument about the site itself and not um, the, how it would affect the broader area. And uh, so it was really difficult for us to, to broaden that scope of what the proposal really meant. And um, obviously the tribal fishery was something that was very uh, interesting to us as a tool for, for broadening that that scope, but some of the other ones that I thought were interesting were um, their inability to really prove they could do an effective cleanup. And the technology uh, for a river like the Columbia River was, was a challenge for them because of the size of the waves. They couldn't prove they could actually do a, a cleanup. So I thought, I thought that, was, that was interesting. Um, another thing that I thought was um, maybe more of an opportunity was there was an election in the middle of this too and it became a big issue for those seats at the port. And uh, this became like the defining issue in uh, who got elected in that position. So I thought that was, that was really interesting, but um, certainly there's um, challenges in every campaign. I, and I enjoy the conversation where you look back and, and try to do lessons learned. But um, I, always, I always think that's a challenge when the proponents are trying to make it just about that site and only that site. And, and we were successful in broadening uh, the scope of that proposal. Thank you. Julie, you'd, you'd mentioned um, sort of a initial suspicion, I think was the word you used about environmental groups and, um, and traditional sort of NIMBY tactics. Um, thinking about this, la this coalition lasting over the course of five years. Um, can, you, can you just talk a little bit about how that proceeded in, in your experience um, and overcoming initial uh, concerns, but also presumably some ongoing issues and sort of how that was handled and uh, what was done well and what could be done better in the future? Sure. I, I was sort of expecting Paul to take this on. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, um, definitely this is an issue when environmental groups want to work with tribes. Um, it's, it's, it's tough because, like I said, there is this suspicion by most tribe, uh, tribal communities to environmental groups. You know, there's this vision that the, the tribes are, you know, the, the crying Indian, you know, from the old commercials, and that they're going to jump on every environmental issue out there. And that's not true. And um, tribes, especially the tribes I work for, have their own economic development that they are considering and interested in. And sometimes, you know, they may be interested in natural gas and not, you know, but then fight, willing to fight on coal. So there's some things that groups need to respect that sovereignty and respect that the tribes need to have their own government and economy and be okay with that. Um, and then meet them at their level and say, okay, we respect you as a sovereign nation, and but we want to develop a coalition on this issue. Um, and really listen to the stories, listen to the elders speak and, you know, don't, you know, speak out of turn. I've learned to be shut, to shut up a little bit and listen. Um, and I, I just want to give a high five to, uh, call out to, Columbia Riverkeeper, because they've been fantastic with um, associating with the tribes in this in this basin. Um, they've been very respectful and very interested in working with the tribes and, and helping the tribes with the issues, but not being the white knight that comes in to save the day. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, and so the coalition that we started at Bradwood, Fighting Bradwood LNG really built up uh, upon itself and has um, lasted to this day and it's been really wonderful um, in that sense. And, and I think the tribes are respectful of the fact that Columbia Riverkeeper has a lot of resources and can get grassroots, you know, going. Um, so I, I guess 
I'll just leave it with that. I mean, the tribes can be great allies, but just understand that you're not going to see eye to eye on every issue and be okay with that and respect that. I don't know, Paul, you want to say anything? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess I could. I just want to thank you, Julie. I think that was really well said. And um, I really, I really wish I could stay on this a little bit longer. Uh, I need to get going here pretty soon. And I don't know if that was announced earlier, but I, I enjoy everybody's um, uh, participation on, on this website. I, I do have just a, a few um, closing comments. Um, when I worked with Julie at the Fish Commission, one of the, and also the Columbia Riverkeeper, who I adore, uh, one of the things that came painfully obvious was these permits for fossil fuel transportation along the Columbia River are numerous and they're coming at us consistently. Uh, it's, a, it's going to be a real challenge uh, for a sustained amount of time. These are, are not going to end. And so we, um, while this was a successful campaign, we can't uh, keep reinventing them each time, especially with this kind of a sustained fight that we're going to have to take over time. And, and so I um, just want to close by thanking everybody for all your really hard work and this hard won victory. It, it's real. Uh, I'm so happy for everybody's uh, campaign together and the relationships we built and, and uh, we really, we really did good work together. And um, I especially want to thank um, uh, the river, uh, Riverkeeper and, and, and uh, Julie at the Fish Commission. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for, for fitting us into, it sounds like a busy day. Uh, we really appreciate you making time for, uh, to join us. Um, and just for, for folks in the audience, um, Paul has to leave us, but the rest of us are going to continue uh, with, the, uh, with the panel discussion. And we'll be opening it up to, uh, to, to questions and, and comments from the, from the audience in just a couple of minutes here. Um, if, if I could, a, a couple of sort of follow-up questions. Um, one, we talked a little bit about sort of the inherent challenges in Thank you, Paul. Uh, we, we did talk a little bit about some of the um, inherent challenges in, in forming coalitions that where, where the different parties have um, sometimes very different interests and different topics to bring up in front of FSEC, et cetera. Um, did any of you observe the companies trying to split the coalition, trying to identify those, those wedge issues or those barriers and, and try and drive a wedge there. Well, I can say from, uh, from a longshore standpoint, you know, being in the union, uh, the company very quickly got on board with, with like the building trades, you know, and they, they were attempting to, to shame the longshore union. And, uh, you know, I can't speak for the firefighters union, because they were opposed to it also. Um, but, you know, shame us, you know, trying to say, you know, an injury to one's an injury to all, you know, what's going on, that's your motto, how come you're not with us? And, uh, you know, the simple fact is, you know, we're not willing to, you know, pair up with the devil, you know, for, for anything. I mean, it's, uh, we were able to turn it around and say, you know, look at how horrible this company is. You know, every union that, that works around Tesoro has got problems with Tesoro. <laughs> you can tell that the, uh, the company was really trying to use the other unions to get us to try and change our position. Uh, same with the port. The port would come to us and, uh, and ask us to, um, you know, back off, basically, in not so many words, but, you know, we, uh, we stood strong, and uh, we sure are glad we did. I think another uh, time when Tesoro tried to sort of split the community was, um, and, and how we countered that was with the Vancouver 101 organization. Um, so Vancouver 101 um, was a 101 businesses in Vancouver who were opposed to the oil terminal. And they self, you know, they worked you know, in parallel tracks with the Stand Up to Oil Coalition um, to elevate their, the voices of the, the business community, the existing business community of Vancouver to explain that they didn't want this facility. Um, so 
that was, um, you know, something that was an effort that was supported and um, you know, flourished you know, at the time of the Stand Up to Oil Coalition, but was not necessarily, you know, under the, the exact umbrella. Um, and it really did help challenge that narrative that, um, that there's a inherent, you know, all businesses are, uh, are lining up behind this oil terminal idea. Kidron and Chris Harry, I wonder if the two of you in particular could, could respond to a, a question about um, sort of prioritization of this particular fight among the other things that are on your plates um, as, as organizations, uh, both One America and is the, the Sherman local. To what extent, uh, can you just talk a little bit about sort of how this issue is prioritized, its, um, its long-term, its risk, and some of the other things in front of you are immediate and perhaps feel more urgent day to day? I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how that decision-making happened uh, within your organizations. Um, I think uh, this is, uh... It was a really important fight that we really got into it because, uh, uh, as personally, I, um, I, at the beginning, I, I have these uh, kind of questions from other people. I mean, why you are fighting for uh, this uh, campaign or train uh, train terminal when we have the this issue with immigration? And then I was confused at <laughs> the beginning, but then I realized and I got this strong idea that that we have to fight for something uh, that lasts longer because uh, uh, if people stay here in the United States in the future, they got, uh, like, for example, uh, they got the permits and everything, but, and then if the, the country is destroyed, so it will be the same thing because as an experience, and I have seen in other places, other countries, how things happen, uh, they always use like a, a stage, like a kind of trampoline to just put the product and take it away to other countries. And always the people who are living in those places, always uh, at the end of five or 10 years, they stay in the same situation or, or worse situation always. So um, I'm thinking more about uh, the kids, the future of, uh, because I had my kids and they are growing on this uh, uh, city. And I'm thinking on them, maybe in the future, they could uh, have the same air that we are uh, getting right now. Or oh, yeah, so I think that's, that's why we, we, we try to, to work for, for the environment. Yeah. And does that logic easily make sense to most of the folks you're working with? Is that an easy case to make or do you feel like you had to defend those decisions? Uh, I think we we gotta work more on that, and then uh, try to educate more the community. Uh, try to to do organize more events where we can talk more about it. Sometimes people can understand because they th they think that if you got this uh, uh, this something good for one, two, or three years, uh, and then they see it that we need to support this, but no, uh, I think we 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 need to think on future things like uh, okay. It's, he is the sorrow and he's offering a good prosperity for Vancouver for five years. And then we don't have to believe this thing. We, we need to think of prosperity for maybe a long term, 50, 20 years in the future. And then people, we need to start changing this kind of mentality and try to, to work what, for what is best for everyone. Yeah, I think we need to work more on that. <laughs> Okay, so as far as uh, prioritizing this fight over others, I don't know that we actually did prior prioritize over other fights we were in, but uh, you know we, we fight every fight, you know, with, with all we have when we're in it. Um, you know, we uh, what we saw is during our lockout. I keep coming back to that. Um, you know, we were locked out by one of our employers at the Port of Vancouver when this all was uh, when this fight began with the oil terminal. And uh, we weren't getting a lot of support from uh, the community or labor. Um, you know, there were, there were unions that were, were crossing our picket line, um, which, you know, we as Longshoremen would never do. Um, 
and uh, you know we were getting we were getting pretty much beat up in the press. So anyway, when the when the oil terminal came along, and you know we saw that we had to fight that to save our working area and preserve our safety or what's left of it down on the docks. Um, you know, we jumped into that fight, and I don't, I'm not sure we really knew what to expect. I don't even think we thought that far ahead. You know, uh, when we came out against the oil terminal at the Port Commission meeting, uh, Brett and uh, who else was there at the Port Commission meeting from River Keepers, Jasmine? Oh, Dan. Dan. It was Dan and Brett. Sorry. Uh, Dan and Brett were there, and, you know, luckily we got to oppose the oil terminal before they spoke. So I think we took a little wind out of their sails, but afterwards they came up and uh, introduced themselves. And uh, that was really the, the start of a wonderful, wonderful relationship. And since it's, since then it's broadened and, and uh, you know, we saw the value in, in, in the fight, you know, from our standpoint, but we got to learn the value in the fight from everyone else's standpoint. And, uh, and I, and I think what, what we gained kind of going back to you know what this what made this coalition lasting and successful is uh you know we we got to we got to meet a whole lot of groups that we didn't know anything about and now we know a lot about them and uh you know our union has a has a really big you know has a huge history of standing up for social causes and uh so it, it makes sense to partner with people that are you know worried about immigration reform and all this and uh you know the environment um and and i'll tell you right now what, what our local took away from from this fight and the coalition is that we've got a lot and i mean a lot of militant support in the environmental community you know in the people who are worried about immigration and deportation i mean it, basically if you're a group that's getting hammered by by the current you know, the, the current leadership of this country, I think we should all be on the same page. Another thing my local saw was, was uh, these groups coming out and supporting us when we needed it. If we had a rally, they were there. And we eventually won our, uh, you know, won our fight with the, with the grain corporation. And, uh, you know, thanks to, thanks to everybody else out there, we, we won our fight with the port and the oil terminal. That's great. Thank you. I don't. I don't know if you all do twinkle fingers to signify that you agree. That's a that's that stands internal culture that I'm now making external. Um, but I find myself wanting to wanting to signal agreement with so much that that everyone's saying here. Um, let me ask just a little bit about sort of the sort of internal dynamics. Um, uh, how did really sort of decision making? Uh, among and between groups working uh, on this fight. How, how did you identify key approaches, um, public comment periods uh, for the environmental impact statement, um, uh, working with, on the, uh, the port commission to end the lease, et cetera? A um, little bit of a question about sort of how, how decision-making happened to, to prioritize one strategy over another. Um, and I'm curious sort of how that decision-making process can can be continued forward to other fights in the region or could be exported to, to other communities with similar challenges. Well, just real quick, I'll say from, a, from the Longshore Union standpoint, the decision-making was pretty easy. Um, it, it, you only had to pass one test, and that was, is it going to really upset the people who have a different view than ours on this oil terminal. So, you to make them mad, hey, count us in. We're there. That's a good decision. Um, so, the Stand Up to Oil Coalition, um, and, and I also want Julie to talk about the legal side of this because that was extensive and um, highly coordinated and phenomenal. Um, the Stand Up so basically there were, there were two parallel tracks to defeat this oil terminal. One is getting Governor Inslee to deny the project um, when FSEC made the recommendation. And the other was to convince the port commissioners to revoke or not renew the lease. And because the coalition was so broad, 
we could pursue both of those full speed ahead. Um, there were different tactics that different coalition members could take on. Um, you know, Cager mentioned that he's part of the political action committee for ILWU, and I know Glicerio and One America has a um, a political branch that can you know engage more on the the electoral side of campaigns. Um, some groups like Riverkeeper, we we can't, but we can sure you know turn out a bunch of people to a rally. Um, and so everyone had a different piece of the pie that they were sort of responsible for. Um, uh, and then the executive committee of the Stand Up to Oil Coalition, which was made up of 13 organizations, you know, met weekly to make sure that we were um, including all of these different voices and all of the pieces that people, you know, offered to bring to the table. Um, and that everyone was, you know, all the ideas were being valued um, and being incorporated into a plan so that the, everything that happened was complementary to, um, to the other you know, activities going on. Um, so it did take a lot of coordination. Um, and I, I think that in the moment, those can be kind of frustrating conversations, but in hindsight, um, you don't regret taking time to understand, you know, why people care about this issue and what they want to do to stop it. Yeah, um, I think as Jasmine mentioned, so she made clearly that we had this battle and then we think we had uh, like this strategy with the governor and the FSEC, but also with the uh, poor commissioners uh, who were important uh, part on this battle because they were who the people who at the end took the decision of denying the, the poor, the leasing of the poor. So uh, we knew about that. So before uh, uh, those uh, uh, elected officials were in place. So uh, as One America, we got a, a, like an arm as, it's like the political arm of organization. So it allows us to participate in politics at the end. So uh, we decided to interview the candidates last year when they room for, uh, for the poor commissioner. And actually, so we sit with them and then we ask questions related to the values of the organization. And yeah, so um, we decided to support the candidate, uh, uh, Don Orange, <laughs> I, who won last year. And I think it was a key because uh, uh, on January 9th, so he, he took a decision with the other uh, other poor, uh, poor commissioners and denying the oil terminal. So I think it's a big win on that by the side. And I feel like proud because we did a lot of work on that. We were knocking doors and working hard with the immigrant communities. And um, yeah, so I think it's something that, that I feel proud, yeah. So um, thank you guys for doing that. I, we, we weren't involved in that election, but it was really fun to watch that. I was so excited for you guys. Um, our process was a little, it was a lot different. Um, and I'd say it's, it was kind of three prongs. You know, I work with our member tribes and their governments. So they, you know, each tribe has its own staff. And, and I know that they were, you know, um, meeting government to government with um, state of Washington and, um, you know, with others on these issues. So I would just feed information to staff and policymakers at each of the tribes. Meanwhile, I was trying to stay connected with Riverkeeper um, through Dan Sears and Brad, just making sure that I was hearing what was going on. Dan would actually give me updates constantly, which I'm so thankful for. He'd, he'd tell me if I needed to go to a meeting or if I needed policy people at certain meetings. That was so useful and so helpful because there's no way I could have handled that by myself. Um, but he would just give me the summary, you know, and so, okay, this is what we need um, some people on. Um, and then, then, then there was a legal part. And so it was an amazing group of attorneys. Um, all of us on this side of the V were, were getting together all the time. We were, you know, the Earth, Earth Justice, I definitely would give them a shout out. The Earth Justice attorneys were rock stars. And they were great to be on that schedule. And, um, you know, so we, so there's those three prongs and all of that just came together and worked out really successful. It was also great that there was an oil train that spilled in Mosier. We're really appreciative of that. Um, that was the day I was filing exhibits 
for LSEC. And it just so happened that this train um, uh, and our guys actually, our enforcement people were out there. And so that helped a lot. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's essentially what we did for organizing. Thank you. So um, I was at this stage in the, uh, in the conversation was planning initially to do sort of another round robin and, and ask about, uh, ask a more general question. But we're starting to get a few, I think, um, really interesting um, detail specific questions. Um, I'm going to derail from what I'm interested in and get to what our, what our audience is focused on. Um, and I will just pause for a second and, and encourage other folks uh, listening in to, to send in questions uh, through the chat feature or through the question and answer feature if, uh, if you'd like to um, ask these panelists other questions. So the first question um, we've gotten is, um, maybe several of you can talk to this, uh, which organization um, initiated the coalition? But, I don't know, Jasmine, if you want to talk a little bit about sort of the genesis from Power Pass Coal and Stand Up Toil. Sure. So, so prior to the flood of oil terminal proposals in the Pacific Northwest, we had um, the flood of coal export terminals. And um, for those projects, around 11 environmental groups um, and health groups came together and formed the Power Pass Coal Coalition. Um, for, uh, for Stand Up to Oil, um, the playbook was similar, um, although a few more, you know, more outreach was needed because the oil trains, you know, touched a different, uh, different pieces of the community. And, um, and then for the Gas Coalition, that we're working on. Um, the goal is to be even more broad with, you know, extending the invitation for the initial round of strategy and messaging and coordination to get more grassroots environmental groups, um, tribal nations or tribal activists engaged at the very onset um, to make sure that those voices are, are, are part of every decision-making uh, level. So I think um, there, there are currently 13 members of the Stand Up to Oil Executive Committee and it doesn't, maybe not, I'll have you to follow up with people if they want the list of all those organizations. What, what do those initial conversations look like um, between say environmental organizations uh, that have been part of the Power Pass Coal fight and the um, one America or or between the um, stand up to oil, which has been many of those organizations were part of the power past coal coalition, which was on a different side of the the coal issue than the, the longshoremen how do those how do those initial conversations play out how did how do those bridges get built in, in the first place I think uh, I jumped into the fight and by the time these coalitions were, were in place, but yeah, so I got introduced to uh, Laura Stevens and then uh, uh, I don't remember the name, but it was a, a Sierra person from the Sierra Club. And then uh, uh, later I met uh, Dan from uh, Columbia River Keepers and we started like uh, having a meeting in a sm small coffee in downtown Vancouver, uh, knowing each other and talking about that. what was the plan for each of us to to do on the future, so, so that's how we we see them in a place and start planning for what to do, and then it's how we start, and then later on I meet more people uh, from other groups, organizations, and that's how we start creating relationships and make it the the coalition stronger. But yeah, so I think it's like <laughs> you meet the people by the time you you are in. <laughs> How did that work uh, with the Longshoremen and Warehouse Union, Kedra? What was the, those initial conversations? Uh, you know, the, 
the conversations we have are basically monthly at our union meetings. And uh, as far as the officers that were, were involved, we were, we were working at the direction of the members, right? And, and uh, what the motion that was made and passed was to do, do everything we could to make sure this oil terminal didn't get built. So, you know, as far as uh, uh, working with environmental or, or really anybody else, it wasn't, it wasn't hard at all. Uh, matter of fact, you know, people, people think that, that Longshore, that all of Longshore is in favor of coal. And that's, that's not true. Uh, we have many locals in Washington and Oregon and California, and uh, each local can set their own path. And uh, the, the Longshore local in uh, Longview, you know, they, they set their path to, to support the coal terminal up there. Local 4 went on record as opposing coal export with Columbia River. Um, just another, just an, it would just be another uh, bulk facility in the river that, that takes up a lot of space and doesn't create a lot of jobs. So anyhow, um, you know, I, I, I can't think of any problems that we really had with, with, with any groups in the coalition. And I think uh, working with them and, and signing on to, to, to what they support was not a, not a hard thing for us to do. And when, when you passed that resolution, had you already begun outreach and discussions with other members of the coalition or was that really the, the very first step? Uh, that, that motion, that, that motion probably came after meeting with some of the, the coalitions and, and I'm just going to, I'll just show you how little I know Jasmine is local for in that coalition. <laughs> the power, you know, the, is it? I, I don't even know. You're talking about executive boards and stuff. I don't know. Does Jared go to those? No, no. Okay. All right. So basically, I don't know. We're just uh, we're just we're just good dogs. We we get we get told where to show up, and and you know, kind of what, what we're going to be talking about, and uh, we're able to add our two cents and, and supporting the group. And other than that, we don't really worry about the direction because we we. We don't believe that 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 you know they're going to go in a direction that we would have a problem with. Yeah, I think anyone who's fighting these major energy projects, and there's probably folks on this conference webinar who who know, it takes you know an all hands on deck approach, um, and the role that you know the the core members of the coalition tried to play was making sure that every single time there was an opportunity to speak out or to participate, that people who wanted to knew about it and they knew how to do it. Um, that um, it didn't take, you know, Cager, you know, not going down to the grain elevator to figure out that there was an FSEC adjudication here and, you know, Dan or, or I could call him and say, this is what's happening. Um, and, and for an environmental group perspective, like we had to be really aware that people were coming to this fight from very different, um, with different motivations than us. And that was okay. Uh, and we could make room for everyone and we could expand our, uh, we could learn, this is a learning moment for us, not a leading moment. Um, and every time we sort of had that approach to how can we, how can we make this bigger? How can we include more people as opposed to how can we bring uh, people into our viewpoint? It's more how can we incorporate other people's viewpoints into this campaign. Thanks. Um, Follow-up question on that one. I'm, I'm jumping around here a bit, Anne, I'm sorry. Um, Follow-up question on that one, Jasmine. If, um, can you, can you talk a little bit more about sort of those communications channels and how you set those, how you set those up and how, how those were made most effective? Mm -hmm. and, sure. And so um, the way that the, the coalition kind of divvied up the work is um, various groups kind of took on various um, pieces of the, of the organizing, um, you know, and to make it, 
to make it as streamlined as possible. Um, you know, we knew that that Dan Sears, for example, like, um, you know, he co he communicated with Julie. Julie didn't get, you know, 9, 10, 15 emails or phone calls um, telling her about one thing. It was, it was one person. So making sure that there were clear organizers um, to connect with all of the folks who are interested in fighting the, the project was really important. Um, it was clear that not everyone was going to get on, you know, we we're going to have 100 people on a conference call once a week telling everyone, you know, uh, what was what was happening this week? Uh, we had to have you know one on one relationships so that the 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 communication channels would be open. Um, yeah. Any additions on on what was effective or what worked? Or we can we can jump to um, another question about the jobs frame and messaging from the opposition. Uh, question is, um, how strong was that dynamic? Um, and did the coalition attempt to counter or focus on the coalition's messaging strengths? So you talked a little bit about this already um, with regards to the, the Vancouver 101. Um, anything to... Yeah. Anything I to just, add? you know, part of our legal case as well as some of our, our, you know, public push was about, it's not just about jobs at the site. You know, Paul discussed how they wanted to make it the site because it's just permitting the site. But we were like, you know, the livelihood of all the people I work for are impacted by this. And it's, you know, it's a billion dollar industry if you consider all of the mitigation that's going on, you know, for example. So we tried as much as we could in both both our public speaking and legal case to bring up the numbers of how much is going in to save the salmon resources and how much is uh, impacting sovereign nations. So um, we tried to twist the jobs, um, you know, narrative in our favor. I think, uh, you know, as far as, far as jobs framing, uh, it, it was, uh, I, I don't think we had to counter it. You know, they, they weren't going to, they obviously weren't going to create the amount of jobs that they said they were going to create. There's just, there's just no way. We know that facilities like that, at least Longshore knows facilities like that run on a skeleton crew. Um, they want to hire as few people as they can so they can up their profits. Um, you know, as far as jobs framing, it was real easy for Longshore to, uh, to counter that. It's, uh, you know, our, our uh, message from the beginning was the, the, the risk far outweighs the reward. You know, if you've got one oil spill, it shuts down the entire river for, for however long. And, and, you know, where it's not going to be opened back up until they clean it up. And we see how, how long it takes them to clean this stuff up. You know, it was, it was real easy. And, and we would have benefited from, from the, the terminal coming in, um, you know, Longshore would have. Uh, would have given our port more money to buy new equipment. Uh, they they would have had uh, money to do infrastructure projects, which which need to be done. But you know, what's the point in, in doing that if you're going to bring a bring a uh, company in that that could pretty much put everybody out of business? So it, it was easy for us. You know, the, the jobs. It wasn't going to bring the jobs. It was going to it was going to cost more jobs than it was going to create. And that was a fact. And you know, when you're when you're dealing with fact, it makes talking about it real easy. Do do you think that you were successful in making that argument, making those cases stick then in the media and the public discourse um, during the political campaigns? Well, yeah, I, th I think that when we, uh, you know, when we're talking about, you know, how how this project would benefit us, but we're not we're not willing to let it come in here without a fight. You know, I don't know what better argument you can make than that. If you've got somebody who, who would benefit, say that they don't want it. And that, I don't think we ever took a beating in the, in the media for that, for sure. And uh, like I said, it was, real, it was real easy to, you know, we could give examples at our own elevator that, at, or at our, at our port where the elevator did an expansion. And of course, they're doing their press conferences talking about how it's going to create you know, 20 new full-time positions 
And as soon as that uh, expansion was done, it, it ended up in a, in a net loss of, I believe, uh, 12 jobs. So, you know, a couple of personal stories or, or, or views to, uh, to come from to, to tell people that, you know, don't, don't believe what you're hearing. I think uh, we try, well, we try it was to not speak much about the, the jobs and all these uh, um, points because uh, they were using all this information for propaganda, bad propaganda for us and then good for them. And yeah, it works because by the time I, I was uh, attacking to people at the doors, they, they, they told me about that, but they're creating jobs and then we're going to have uh, more money and good pay. And then, but yeah, so it was that time when we had to, to, to do these conversations with the people and explaining why a long term uh, it would only uh, benefit for for people and for our communities because uh, as experience I, I have been living in other part other countries and I have seen how companies uh, go and then uh, make the the people lose the right of the of the mountains and the trees and then they go for for five years and then they cut the trees and then they go away and the, the communities always stay poor and poor. And it was the, the case here. So uh, people, when they offer something good, we, we think, okay, we are going to have prosperity, but it will be used for a short time, not a long time. So it was an example that we, we could use to, to talk to, to the community. And I also think, um, just kind of real quick, we were so effective at framing that too, to the point where, Tesoro is saying under deposition, well, you know, oil spills create jobs too. Right? So, you know, if, if you got the company saying that, you know, you got them beaten on the run. Um, so I think, Ann, it is going to queue up a question uh, from an audience member for us. Um, well, she's setting that up. Can someone quickly let us know what are the railroad companies that were involved in this project? So it's Burlington Northern Santa Fe has the main line into Vancouver, Washington. Um, there are two um, tracks that, that go along the, the Columbia River. The northern side, the Washington side is Burlington Northern Santa Fe. The southern side is Union Pacific, and that's where the town of Mosier, Oregon is located that had the um, oil train derailment and, and fire that, that Julie referenced earlier that really catalyzed or, or I think brought home a lot of the, the concerns we've been seeing you know, all across the country around oil trains. All of a sudden it happened. It happened in our community um, where people were recreating, fishing, living, going to school. And have uh, have we got the technology figured out to? <laughs> yes, I, um, Roz, if you want to ask your question on camera, I'm sending you a little uh, request. And um, if you'd rather not do that, then uh, we can ask on your behalf. Uh, it says, Roz, Isaac, oh, we'll start video later. Okay. Let's go to the question, Alex, from that came in the Q and A from Paula B, and I will see if I can elevate uh, Paula here. Okay. <laughs> it might be that. Uh, that people would rather we ask on their behalf, but just in case, let's try to unmute Paula too. Paula, can we hear you? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask on Paula's behalf. Paula's question is, how did you, you talked about messaging a little bit. How did you develop consistent messaging? Um, I think among the different members of this coalition. Well, from, from a coalition standpoint, it required a lot of listening to the various organizations, tribal nations, community groups, um, 
who were voicing their concerns or opposition to the project. So the first step in developing the messaging was a lot of listening. Um, and then, you know, the second step is incorporating that into a, a nice little messaging guide that gets reiterated every single time you do a public presentation, every single time you do a press release, every single time you, you know, write an article, um, you make sure that you mention the things that the people um, who are fighting the terminal care about, the impacts to the Fruit Valley neighborhood, the impacts to, you know, the, the safety impacts um, to tribal fishermen, the impacts um, to the longshoremen and the concerns of first responders. Um, so really developing that messaging guide um, that we used as part of the coalition came from a lot of listening to what people were, um, what people were saying. And, and there were comms people, you know, organization have, have comms staff who, who help with this. I don't want to say it just, you know, appeared out of nowhere and wasn't, um, wasn't in any way, you know, professionally crafted. Um, it, it, it certainly was. Um, from our perspective, you know, I, on messages, I just feedback what my tribal elders and the people I work for, what their message is. So there's no crafting necessarily. It's usually from the heart. Um, it's the people that are on the river and experiencing things, and this is what they experience. Um, I do as a core, sort of a facilitator in between two worlds, right? Um, I would listen to Riverkeeper's message and say, and then present that to the commissioners and say, this is where the environmental groups are and this is where the developer group is. And, and you know, hopefully our message is aligned, but you know, as I work for Sovereign Nations, so um, that the message is not so crafted perhaps as a uh, river keepers is. <laughs> is it, did, did it ever come up that it was out of alignment that there was a, it, it, it strikes me that to some extent, different voices getting to similar ends is, is valuable. Um, it allows people to follow sort of different trains of logic. Um, does that make sense? Is, is that your experience or? Well, in the legal case, it actually, it lined up just fine. I mean, we had, you know, the city of Washougal, um, city of Spokane, um, Clark County. I mean, Clark County wasn't necessarily opposed to the project, but they have, you know, property there, you know, a jail right next to there and they had some issues there. And so it was, very focused on that, but I think that was really, you know, okay, their, their siloed issues um, worked with ours just fine. I don't know, it seemed like it was really, it, it flowed very well. And, you know, we worked together with the developers and their interest in focusing okay. on to develop, you know, develop that property. And so I think that we all, yeah. our justice attorneys were really good about sort of spearheading all of this. <laughs> in terms of the legal case, it, it actually flowed really well because we all had to file our own briefs um, and everybody had their um focus. Spokane, you know, was way far away, but they, their issues were just as important. I mean, and I think what was really for the legal case, and this is an interesting adjudication um, because FSEC's a little different than your usual court of appeal, you know, um, court cases. There's a little bit more um, latitude uh, for, for arguments. But I think having it so expansive, having Washougal, having Spokane, having Clark County um, mm -hmm. was actually very powerful in the end because the council members, you know, they were sitting there, they recognized that there were so many different interests up there. And, you know, all of us were opposed because of different reasons. It just compounded it at the end. That, that makes sense. So we, we have a couple of other questions that have, have come in, but maybe I can um, blend them together and, um, and ask each of you to 
speak in turn, sort of thinking about other similar fights and um, maybe for, for folks up north working on the Kinder Morgan uh, pipeline fights or for, for other similar fights around the, around the region. Um, how do you see, what, what lessons um, would you suggest to have learned here that, that would be valuable um, for those other for those other challenges to corporate power? Um, I can speak for, because uh, I, as I mentioned before, uh, so we have this fight with immigration, but also we did, we jumped into this fight with about the oil terminal. Uh, I think what I learned is that uh, uh, the unity, when people really get united, we can accomplish a really big and strong things. Uh, I think it's something that I learned. And then all the support that we had from other, from the different groups and other different organizations and people, uh, uh, I'm, I had a chance to meet uh, uh, really good people that I really appreciate, beautiful people. Like I can mention uh, uh, Joel and all these people that I met in Seattle by the time I was there and uh, Laura Stevens and um, Jasmine. <laughs> and yeah, so I had a chance to meet um, people that I never met before in my life, the way they think, the way they see the nature, the way they think about the, a tree, uh, uh, the weather, the river. So uh, I think it was a learning process for me also, and uh, I really feel proud of that to be with them. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, the, <laughs> you know, if you're in a fight and you're looking for support from somebody, you know, it's, it's good that it's not one-sided. You know, if you come in and you want labor support, you know, then, then you need to be willing to support labor. You know, if, uh, if you've got, if you got picket lines up, obviously you honor the picket lines. Um, you know, maybe not just turn around and drive away or walk away from the picket line, stop and see what the issue is. Ask them how, how you can help. Um, that's, that's what happened with us. And, uh, you know, our, uh, our local was very appreciative of, uh, the interest that was taken in our work and our workplace. And, uh, you know, it was nice, uh, nice feeling respected by some folks. And, uh, you know, you give what you get. So if the longshoremen can help anybody that, that uh, have helped us, we'll do that. Yeah, I think definitely. Oh, sorry. Yes. Go ahead. I think I just, I'm just real quick. I think you hit the, the nail on the head, Kigger. That's it, showing respect for the um, other groups um, and understanding that they have their own interests. You know, it's the, the same message that I gave earlier about the tribes. Um, you know, being open to Spokane and, and Washougal and everybody, because my goodness, you know, the more interests, the more fights, and even if their fight, their, their interests are different, the better. That's the only way we're going to beat these guys because they're way too big and having more disparate interests, I think is, is actually a plus. Thank you. Yeah. And just a nod to the uh, to the coordination and the communication that happens, the relationship building um, that it that it took to 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 build a strong network of opposition, um, it isn't it isn't a small a small feat, um, and it, it really does take a number of conference calls and listservs and one on one conversations and emails and you know. The work is not easy, um, but it's always worth it in the end to make sure that everyone who wanted, who wants a voice or, or, or wants to be represented is represented. Um, and so I just, I can't nail, nail that down anymore. Just the, the, the coordination, it takes time, um, it takes thought, it takes respect um, and learning. And it's, um, and it's, it's really critical. Uh, that's um, well said. 
Um, so just to wrap up our, our conversation today, I think there's there's one more uh, person on the line on the line. Um, Don Sankey is a volunteer extraordinaire, um, one of the leaders on this uh, on this fight from from the ground in Vancouver. I think he's on the line and, and had just a couple of uh, comments he wanted to, to add to our discussion. Uh, are you there, Don? Uh, yeah, I'm there. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Um, I joined late. I'm sorry. Uh, in Vancouver, our first messaging was directed toward Governor Inslee because we know he cares a great deal about global warming, climate change, and so on. And so we had different messages depending on who we were targeting. And we, Riverkeeper called me in 2013 and said, what do we do next? And I said, well, how could Governor Inslee approve of the oil terminal if the city of Vancouver were to oppose it? So I started a steady drumbeat in the Columbian online comment section saying, if you think the oil terminal is a bad idea, how will the governor know unless you write them? If you think the oil terminal is a bad idea, how will the city council know unless you tell them? And after seven months of that, the city council passed a resolution opposing the oil terminal and, uh, and it was based on rail safety concerns. Uh, and Inslee was smart and uh, FSEC was smart not to focus on the rail safety concerns. They focused on uh, earthquake and uh, liquefaction zone issues at the tank farm down at the port because the rail issues could be, they could be appealed based on, on interstate commerce clause issues. And so the strength of the, that decision came about uh, from, uh, from them focusing on things other than rail. And uh, uh, and if anybody had any questions about our campaign, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, Don. We'll we'll um, we'll make sure that folks can get in touch with you if there's additional follow-up questions. We are we're running out of time here today, and I just want to say thank you again. Thanks, Don, for joining us, and thank you to uh, all of the panelists. Um, thanks for all of the work that you've all done over the last five years um, to beat this project, uh, to, to stop big oil in their tracks. Um, this is a great example of coalition building, um, and um, thanks for, for sharing your stories with us today. Unless Anne jumps in quickly and tells me there's something else I'm supposed to say at the end of the webinar, I'm going to call us wrapped up. I think you're good. Thanks to everybody for your time on this campaign and, and sharing your lessons with us today. And thanks for Alex, to Alex for your work and leading the conversation and to our audiences here and on Facebook and everybody behind the scenes um, with you all and with us making all this happen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all, and I'm just uh, stopped the uh, Facebook stream and I'm gonna uh, shut us down here too. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye KJ, bye Glossario. Bye, bye. bye. Thanks again. Great work.